Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the um, Trusted CI webinar for March 18th, 2024. I'm your host, Jeanette Dapheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Lessons from the Accord Project with Ron Hutchins, uh, Tho Nguyen, and Neil McGee. Uh, Ron is a principal scientist at the University of Virginia. Um, Tho is a senior program officer at the National Academies of Science, and Neil is an assist associate professor of data science at the University of Virginia. Um, before we begin, I have a few things to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. Um, just click on the chat icon and the window will pop up. And um, Ron is open to questions during the presentation as well as the end. So if you have a question, um, we'll, we'll ask him during the presentation. With that, I will hand things over to Ron. Ron, welcome. Thank you, Jeanette. It's good to be here. Let me share my screen. Oops. And then kick off presentation. Okay, is that working for everybody? All right, <clears throat> we appreciate being uh, uh, invited to present today. Uh, and I hope what we have is interesting for you. We're gonna talk through a bit of the history of Accord and uh, uh, a bit of history before Accord, in fact, at University of Virginia, which led up to the Accord project, and then go through Accord from a standpoint of policy and architecture. And uh, I'd like to start with a couple of stories. So we're now gonna share some stories with you that were motivating for us. Uh, back about seven or eight years ago, probably 2016, uh, I was a VP for IT at University of Virginia and focusing on research computing as a major function for the university. Um, I got a call from someone uh, on the medical side who was working uh, with the Navy on a project that involved Navy SEALs. Uh, he was looking at research on um, what happens to the SEALs when they fire shoulder-mounted weapons. The, 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 the pressure wave from the back of the blast comes around and hits them in the back of the head. And uh, these folks had uh, put sensors in the helmets and were collecting the data on uh, the, the SEALs as they fired these weapons. Uh, it was a fascinating story to me, but what was mo more fascinating from my, my um, IT standpoint was he didn't have a place to put the data because it was considered basically CUI data. It was really important that the Navy SEALs, their names and location, and the information they were collecting wasn't leaked out. So uh, we started working with him to try to secure his data. That was one of our major motivators for uh, moving forward with a, a big infrastructure project at UVA. Secondly, in working with the folks in the education school, we found that some of the professors there were doing research in the K-12 arena, uh, taking videos, videos of students in the classroom for behavioral studies. And this is uh, personally identifiable information. It's really hard to de-identify uh, video. So uh, they came and asked us for a place to put their data. They didn't have a place to put it. Uh, the third piece that was motivating for us was out of UVA Wise. <clears throat> we had a, UVA Wise is not a major research uh, institute, but it, they do do some research. And one of the researchers came to us with a project they're working with, uh, I want to say with uh, uh, one of the federal agencies, <coughs> excuse me, on, <coughs> it's called <coughs> Healthy, App excuse me, <coughs> it was, <coughs> it was called Healthy Appalachia. Uh, they were collecting health data from people along the Appalachian corridor, and they needed a place to store this data. And though I think you had another story you're going to talk to us about, right? Uh, yeah, just uh, really quickly. Uh, again, I'm I'm Thor Nguyen. I'm at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Um, just for uh, quick context, uh, I worked with Ron on the a uh, core project, and I uh, was the uh, project manager uh, up until about two years ago prior to joining the academies. And um, it's it's a very important um community effort, and so I'm glad to to be part of it. The, um, the the one other motivating story we wanted to share was, um, as Ron mentioned, um, UVA has a um, a sister campus in Wise, Virginia. It's, it's not a, a research um, institution. It's a non-PhD granting institution, as a matter of fact. 
And um, there's a uh, there was a an early career researcher there. Um, she was a uh, in psychology, I believe, fresh out of graduate school. Um, she really wanted to continue her research. Uh, she worked on sleep research, where she collect and analyze and store and you know work on um, sleep um, data that she collected firsthand. Um, anyhow, as a as a non PhD granting institution, um, they they were not set up to support research. Um, and um, yet yeah, it's it's really a um, a recruitment issue. It's something that they wanted to enable their faculty to do. Um, they they want to become a research um, institution. Um, but as as we all know, uh, supporting you know three researchers or three hundred researchers um, is it, it takes almost the same amount of effort, right? I mean, it's um, it's it's not like the um, the, the data that's uh, being worked on uh, by one researcher is somehow less important than uh, than by more than, than one. Um, I just actually um, in preparing for this, I looked up that um, that one faculty member. She has actually left UVA Wise um, and has, has gone to another institution. And and to be honest, I um, I wonder if it's um, it has to do with you know the the, the environment of being able to continue her research there. So yeah, so um, back to you, Ron. But I just wanted to share that that um, yeah. aspect as well. Yeah. So um, first off, um, we give a great shout of thanks to National Science Foundation for supporting this work. As always, we appreciate it. Um, we gave you the stories to set up for how we begin in this area. Uh, as VP for IT, uh, I was seeing from all across the campus a lot of need for um, for research and protected data and to set up an infrastructure that we could use for that. So uh, in, in doing some planning, we came up with a, a set of uh, uh, needs and then we came up with some goals. Uh, the need basically was uh, around the fact that we were fragmented across the schools, uh, the health side, uh, the education side, and every project was being built on its own bottom from scratch basically. In engineering, um, a faculty member would need uh, to secure data and the IT folks there would buy, buy a computer, they would put the software on it, they would secure it, they would start from scratch and build the entire system. Uh, that's not efficient. Uh, and we've tried to fix that with our projects here. We found a growing need to address um, uh, controlled unclassified information. As I mentioned up front, the Navy SEALs, information about that was highly classified. It wasn't classified, it was highly controlled. And there was an expanding need outside of the medical center for hosting both PHI and PII. I mentioned the School of Education, which is not in the medical side. And securing the data we found as we were doing these projects one off meant raising the complexity for access by the researchers. The researchers don't want to have administrative overhead. They don't, they want to do their research. And what we were uh, confronted with was the need to simplify the the mechanisms that they had for doing the research. So in trying to figure this out, uh, it was clear that we had a problem across the university between the administrative units that had to be involved. There were a lot of units that needed to be involved and uh, uh, it took getting all of them in the same room at the same time in order to, to get number one, build trust and number two, get information out. So we started having regular meetings like every other week with information security risk management, uh, legal counsel, uh, administration leadership, the departmental school IT personnel and our technical experts. And those meetings were very fruitful. It was amazing to, to get those people in the same room and hear from each of them the issues that they had with us hosting the data and their, their possible solutions to that. Uh, at the end, we, we put together um, um, a plan. We started working towards that plan and then brought in outside experts uh, to help us harden the process. It's so interesting to me that there's not any kind of unified set of security standards for this whole area of protected data. Uh, there's PHI, but from my understanding, at least the last time I checked, there was no book that said PHI like there is 800-53 from NIST uh, for, for things like CUI and so forth. And so, you know, there's the 20 controls, there's all kinds of ways to do this, but they're not unified. 
but we brought in outside experts to try to help us harden the process as much as we could and document what uh, what uh, uh, processes we we uh, needed to do and how we uh, built the rules around them. And then, of course, we generated reports and had to get things uh, approved by the university. I'm kind of pausing here between slides to see if anybody has questions. So, Jeanette, feel free to interrupt me if you see anybody. We're good for now. Thank you. All right. So we ended up putting together a set of goals. And the goals are, were fairly clear. They're fairly simple uh, up front. Uh, we decided we wanted to try to put together a system that could be used for multiple different purposes. Now we watched, I, I can't remember if it was University of Florida, University of Central Florida, who put together a system that they were gonna use for all their CUI work. And they ended up, uh, it, it wouldn't work for all their CUI work. They had other issues with that. So we tried to learn from their lessons and tried to not consider that this was a one size fits all, but it was a, a, a system that we thought we could use for CUI. Uh, and we hoped that it might work for other, other uses as well. So what we tried to do was to build out a unified space for the data storage for uh, analytics and archiving of the protected data. We ended up having to keep the CUI separate with an air gap. Um, the requirements for CUI, according to our interpretation, implied that we had to have it <clears throat> as an air gap system. We couldn't have others on the same system. So that's why we left that. We basically replicated that system <clears throat> and put it together for uh, doing PI, PHI, and uh, other, uh, other types of protected data. And the way we did that in, in order to separate these things, and Neil's gonna talk about this a good bit in a minute, was to walk through containerization in order to support this without doing hardware air gap. Uh, but one of the major things that we found from our faculty was the process for onboarding research into our system was taking 30 to 45 days. It took a long time to go through background checks and citizenship checks and to do the, the training and the instructions for the graduate students who needed to access the system and to set up their IDs and to set up the VPNs and do the filters for the network and all these kinds of things. And this was one of the major hurdles that we found was by the time we were getting ready to onboard the researcher, they'd already gone out and tried to buy cloud resources, which they were managing themselves and they weren't as protected as we needed them to be. So it's a risk that we were trying to avoid there. Now, at, 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 at one point, as we've mentioned, we gave you two stories from UVA Wise about the smaller schools and the needs there. Uh, and talking to other folks in Virginia, we had meetings on a regular basis with other schools in Virginia. We found that it wasn't just UVA Wise who was having problems with not having a place to put protected data, but with some of the other smaller schools as well. That motivated us to start looking at how we could expand the system that we had built at University of Virginia in order to allow other schools to come in. And so we started looking at a few additions to our system in order to put this together. And this is where the NSF award came in. Uh, we, we received an NSF MRI award <clears throat> through UVA WISE to augment the UVA systems in order to allow other uh, universities to come in. Now, a couple of stories in front of that was uh, were important to get on the table. And talking to legal counsel for how we could bring other schools in, they first said, oh, just do a subcontract, a research subcontract. We'll be a subcontractor or there'll be a subcontractor on our research and then we can do it because that's why we do this. It wasn't acceptable. So we started talking about bringing other folks in uh, into our system and what the risks were with that. So between risk management and legal, they said, well, we have legal risks here and we have uh, risks for you know, uh, financial risks in case of a problem. It turns out that all the public schools in, in, in Virginia are under the same attorney general, which meant that we were all really in the same organization from a legal standpoint. And so all we had to do was put together MOUs, which are really contracts, but they were between the same organization. That allowed us to bring in the other schools in, uh, in the state of Virginia. Uh, the other thing that we found out was interesting was that uh, I think Virginia Tech had put together a state contract for cyber insurance. And all the other public universities that had cyber insurance were using that same contract. So the fact that we all had cyber insurance meant that if we have a problem, only one of us would have to pay the deductible. 
and uh, the risk would be covered. And that gave us a finite risk, which is what risk management likes. They like to see a finite amount of risk that we have for this. And that's where we got to. So uh, interestingly enough, that helped us to, to get further on with our work with legal and with risk management. So in order to take those wins and move forward, we need to do a couple of things. Uh, we didn't want to have to give everybody in the other schools a UVA account. So uh, Neil and some of his partners in crime there at UVA put together uh, an in-common instance and a co-managed instance for managing the, the Federation of IDs and, uh, and the virtual organizations. And Neil, you may talk about that later. You may not, but that's something that we did that Neil was instrumental in. We expanded the onboarding process for non-UVA researchers inside the state. Uh, we opened up office hours with our uh, uh, with our support team, <clears throat> excuse me, to help others. And then we brought in again the outside certification of the system. Uh, Tho called this a compliant, a compliant capable system. It's hard to call it compliant because compliance is basically end to end. So if you take the system that we built and then you make some additions to it, it becomes a compliant system. This is one of the hardest things that we had to, to teach our partner schools was that they say, oh, your system's compliant. And we had to say, well, our system is compliant capable. You have to work with us to do the end-to-end -end compliance in order to host your data on our system for your sponsors. So we brought an outside certification for that. Uh, one of the other things we ran into, one of our researchers, uh, uh, I, I haven't said yet, but at some point during the COVID pandemic, we expanded uh, with a, an additional um, NSF support to outside of the state of Virginia. That was another interesting foray into legal and risk management, but we were able to do that. And one of our partners from North Carolina, Eastern Carolina University, needed uh, a COMSOL license. And so we went to COMSOL to, well, we had COMSOL, they had COMSOL, but for him to use COMSOL on our system was something outside of the licensing that was done and we had to go to the manufacturer in order to get a way to manage that. And so that was another interesting thing we can talk about under lessons learned. And that was the expansion outside of the state of Virginia that I just mentioned. Uh, I'm gonna let Neil talk through the system architecture uh, and then we'll go from there. Great, hi everybody, uh, Neil McGee. I'm, I'm now an associate professor in the School of Data Science, but but uh, until even just a year ago, was working in research computing here at UVA. So yeah, I was uh, I was in charge of the, the the technical crew that put this together and um, sort of executed the plan. I uh, to give you some background on the system that that Ron already alluded to. The original system to handle CUI and and PHI at UVA uh, was called Ivy. And I I started in 2016, and I guess Ivy was just emerging as a system at that point. Um, built on virtual machines, so large uh, host machines, several racks of them, a lot of storage arrays behind that. And we would just slice off a virtual machine for each researcher. And we had sort of a segment for CUI that was very highly regulated and completely separate. And then the PHI and FERPA and, and other uh, lower level security um, requirements section was in, a, in another stack. And we were using VMware. We would create the VM, we'd load it with Windows or Linux. And then uh, the joke was, the, yeah, for, and this is for UVA only, uh, you needed to use the high security VPN. You needed a special USB dongle to sort of uh, verify into that VPN. You needed to go to an office and show identification. And, uh, and it is not an exaggeration of the 30 days to get onboarded, let alone build the machine and get the software installed and everything. Um, and so the uh, the joke internally was Ivy was so secure you couldn't use it. Um, it was just it was just cumbersome and hard to get people in there. And the onboarding overhead was was a, was a lot. And then it became this uh, this bespoke customized VM that we sort of had to walk through as a support team of engineers. We had to walk through and support it with updates and patching and so on as as it moved through time. Um, because we didn't want the, the, we couldn't, by security policy, couldn't allow the researchers to be root or to do system-wide level changes and so on for security reasons. So when Ron and Tho came to us to say, let's think about how we could build a cord, and um, and you could flip forward to the next slide, Ron, we, we, we rethought several things at that point. One was 
well, how can we uh, how can we accelerate the pace of 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 deploying these environments for people? Sometimes folks just needed an environment for a, a, a few weeks or a month. Sometimes that was very long lived and they needed it for a year or, or two. So there were different lengths of, of time. Um, but we noticed they were all generally using Python and R. So that was highly supportable. It was, it was pretty rare that it was a customized environment. And the CUI was a, a, a rare thing. So we could leave CUI where it was in VMs and just focus on PHI, FERPA, business confidential level security. And, and at that point, it just seemed smart to make this a web access tool, to try to get rid of VPN, to, uh, to try to get rid of, of these security dongles. And by that time, UVA had moved on to using Duo um, anyway. And then that we could use containers to build these pre-formatted environments. We can manage the container images behind the scenes. It, it becomes sort of like a cloud service in this way that a, a researcher who's onboarded can come to a portal, they click a start button and their environment starts honestly within about five seconds. And they just click into it and it's a web enhanced, you know, web enabled application. And they could use at that point, they could use Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebooks, RStudio, or Thea, which is a, an IDE that looks a lot like VS Code. So just a nice, smart, you know, Python R uh, enabled IDE. And the fact that we could get rid of remote desktop and get rid of SSH and just have it all displayed through a web interface meant really the best thing, and this is what Ron pointed out a minute ago, is that we could now use in common authentication, which almost every US higher ed institution uses, almost all government institutions. Also in Canada, also Jayant is the network in Europe that's completely compliant with that. So it's a standard, it's a SAML authentication standard that's really easy to, to plug into. That's the first great thing to leverage. The second was that the NSF had already funded a project called CoManage, which is a, a virtual organiza organization management tool. It's, it's basically an LDAP that's meant to play within common. It can also play with Google authentication and OAuth and, and other, other authentication methods, but it was sort of built for creating a virtual LDAP and you could populate it with members from any institution. And that means they don't suddenly have their new user username and ID in our system. They can just use their home credentials. So when they hit the Accord application or even for filling out you know, an application at the beginning or using the tool later on down the road, they are kicked back to their home institution where they authenticate. They use two-factor to sign in and then they're sent back to us. You know, and we now know, oh, the following people are members of this project A, and therefore we can handle that project. And that means we can scope all of their applications and their storage and their user user pool all within that virtual organization as just a group, just an LDAP group, basically. So that was fantastic. Using the containers within a Kubernetes environment meant that we could just we could spin them up on demand and then the 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 PIs or the researchers could turn them off when they're done or we could watch for activity. And after two hours of inactivity, we just turn them off automatically behind the scenes. Um, the third bullet here, reverse proxy, it was nice that we could get rid of VPN. And, and essentially, as each institution signed into a cord or, or joined the cord program and enrolled, we could get their campus CIDR blocks, their, their campus addressing blocks and, and authorize those into our, into our proxy. So the, the application is not open to the entire internet at all. It, each institution, whether you're, you know, if you're at, a, at, at William & Mary, you could be in your campus office and access a cord, or you can be using the VPN at William & Mary and, and access it just as well. So either path works. Um, and the reverse proxy means that we can control and, and observe the flow of, of traffic and requests and put a little bit of security uh, passively um, in between there. The fourth bullet, uh, the posture checking, this was a requirement by UVA. And it was it was nice because they stepped up financially, I think, to help provide this. But one of their worries was, well, as Ron said, this is an end-to-end -end solution. And we don't control, we don't control their end, basically. The researcher could come with a laptop or a desktop machine that has um that could be suspect or it could be compromised. And so we need to know that. And so posture checking is a bit of software that runs remotely on the client 
uh, real passively. It doesn't have an identifier with it in terms of a name or anything, but it says, is this machine fairly well patched? Does it have an encrypted hard drive? Uh, it just has to meet some minimal security requirements according to UVA's policy. And then that little agent just sends a message back. We use a company called uh, uh, OpsWat, and the, the tool is called Meta Access. And it basically just sends a little you know, a little message to the API at, at OpsWat saying, this machine is okay. It meets all the policies. And then when you authenticate, when each researcher authenticates to, to Accord, we can basically go check the status of that little token and say, hey, the, the token associated with Ron Hutchins is that is his machine that he's accessing from right now. Is that meet uh, our, our requirements? And if it's compliant, we let him in. And if it's not, we send a message on screen saying, you you know, here are the following reasons you've you failed that. Um, I won't I won't go through the rest of the, the bullets other than to say that proxy out to the internet is also a control, uh, an important control that UVA was real uh, adamant about keeping, which I, I see merit in. You can't just build a secure system, especially not CUI, but you can't build a secure system and then allow complete egress to the internet to go grab any software you want or any, any tool out there. So we don't allow people to go to GitHub. We don't allow people just to pull random zip files. But we do have an authorized kind of an ACL of, of particular places that people need to go. They need to be able to go to PyPy or to CPAN or CRAN and grab packages. And they can do that and install it in their user space. That user space, and that they do that by default. So their packages are always in their home directory. So when they come in the next time, the packages are still there. And that storage persists, even though their sessions might be a variety of different containers over time. And that's probably the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll end with and I'll throw it back to you, Ron, is, is what I really appreciated and that I don't think I, I grasped in the beginning was setting up these different environments in, the term, in terms of different container images means that you can actually come to your data and come to your work from a variety of different means depending on what you need to do that day. So if you need to do some statistical work and you just want to bang out some R and get some, you know, crunch some things really quickly, then you can come in with R Studio and do that. But then if you need to build something more of a, of a workflow that's in Python, you can come from a different container image and work from that angle at a different time. So you're not, you're not stuck with one environment that's fixed in its, in its software and its abilities. You've got, uh, you've got several different angles to come to it from. I'm seeing a question. Oh. Yep, we have a question here. What's the obligation in the contracts of remote institutions to notify UVA if an account at their university has been determined to be breached? That could potentially mean an incident in accord. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one and then anybody else can jump in. Part of what we are gonna talk about in just a minute is some of the documents and some of the agreements that we had, had to have everybody sign. And so there's an MOU that comes with this, and that MOU specifies things like, yeah, you know, what do you have to, who do you have to notify, when do you have to notify, a lot of the details of that. Uh, and by the way, all those documents that we've put together are available as part of the collateral from Accord. Uh, we want to make those available to the community to use and, and as a foundation, or move from them and do better, and let us know what the better way to do it is. So it's a great question. It is addressed in the MOUs. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about the research use data agreement in a minute as well. So we'll come back to that again. I would also add, uh, Jay, just to, for you to know, as, as we onboard institutions into Accord, we sort of send out a security questionnaire. It's probably got 20 questions, but for, for us to understand their security posture and how they handle things, um, certain bits of uh, pieces that, that UVA Information Security Office wants to know, like what sort of two-factor does the campus use, if, if at all, and they need to use something? What's their password policy? How, how, how are those updated and how often are they? And then, and then as I imagine Ron will talk about the, you know, what sort of data use policy uh, does that campus have? Because that's, that's the policy the researcher is, is bound to. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Move, I think we're good. Move, Thank you. Moving on. Now, um, we wanted to do a, a part of our presentation on lessons and insights learned. You know, I think from my perspective, technically, Accord was a good success. I think we did good things. We found the good technologies. Neil and his team did a great job for us. 
I mean, overall, I think we wanted to do better at bringing more researchers on. And it was frustrating for us not to get more people who wanted to come on, who were willing to come on and, and help us with troubleshooting that. So we started asking the question, why? Why is it that we struggled with that? And just to, to start off here with the, the discussion, we basically had to start with defining protected data and the risks associated with that data type. This is what Neil was alluding to. <clears throat> Every university has a different definition of, of data types and, and how to protect them. And so we had to try to come up with definitions there. One of the biggest hurdles that we ran into was defining ownership of the research data. Our researchers that came to us initially said, oh, we said, well, whose data is it? Oh, I own this data. I collected this data. It's my research data. Well, in talking to legal counsel, that's not true. The university owns the data. And the researchers didn't know this. And so they thought they were going to sign the agreement with us. And it turns out they had to go to their leadership to get the agreement signed, which was uh, you know, eye-opening to a lot of people. And I think the, the stakeholders, defining stakeholders and who has what responsibility is really, really important here. Uh, we had to go to the, 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 the CISO at the universities. We had to go to the, the CIO. We also had to go to their legal counsel. And if they had risk management, we had to go there. And uh, one of the other things that came up over the, the time is who actually does own the data. If the researcher gets data from an outside entity, then that entity has to be involved with this as well. Uh, risk management was a, a really interesting thing. A lot of universities are, are self-insured. And so risk management has to be a part of the discussion because they're gonna be on the hook in case something gets breached and we have to pay. Uh, so we, the last bullet here, we talked about a RACI diagram, uh, which talks about you know, responsible parties, you know, authoritative parties, communicated parties, and informed parties. And coming up with that diagram and clearly understanding who is responsible, who is authoritative, and who has to be communicated with was absolutely crucial for us. And building that RACI is a part of our agreements with the other schools. So, you want to uh, Ron, there's a question. I don't know if you want to address. Okay, go ahead. Um, so how does uh, UVA handle the no foreign requirement of federal contracts involving CUI? Well, we had to deal with that on our own personnel since our CUI hosting was done on campus uh, by us. Uh, we had to ensure that uh, none of our personnel were foreign nationals. And that was part of our certification for going through the 800-171 process with our outside third party. So that was a part of what we had to do. So um, this is where, this is one of uh, another um, key lessons that um, we learned through the Accord effort. Um, as, as mentioned, getting an Accord to the point where we're able to offer service within UVA and, and with um, external users we have to go through a um, you know, talk to stakeholders that we didn't think that we uh, that were involved in this, um, including insurance, for example. And um, one of the things that um, we learned that you know Ron and I still bear the scars for, and we'll probably bear the scars for uh, for the foreseeable future, is that it's all about the institution, right? We we're, we work within an inst the institution, and it's if we don't make the institution happy, nothing's going to happen. And when it comes to the institution, it's, it's all about managing risk. It's it's it comes down to that. And um, for those of us who've been um, in this space um, for a while, we know that there, there's there's no such thing as you know safe or unsafe or secured or or non secured systems, right? It's it's the ability to reduce risk to to the point of tolerable risk. I think it's about it's about uh, where we are with that. Um, and as as Ron um, alluded to earlier as well, you know, being being um, compliant with something is not again. It's also not something that you it's 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 black and, and white, right? It's it's whether you're compliant with something is a decision that is uh, made by your general counsel whether they're willing to say that you met all the requirements, and that's advised by um, all the aspects that could bring risk um, to the institution. 
And so with that, we, we came up with this abstraction. Um, and again, because it's an abstraction, there, there are many ways to look at this. And uh, But this is how what worked for us. It really helped us think through what is really going on and how we can navigate this. Uh, in the very middle of this is the uh, the box that is risk uh, to the institution, and the and the um, the dotted box is the institution itself, or my poor attempt at representing that. Uh, what whatever we do in security, all the um, the mechanism, the the the, the processes, and and the, and the guidelines, is to reduce that risk. Is is to to make it manageable, not to eliminate it. Um, not that we don't want to eliminate it. It's just it's just that we can't. And um, how else do we deal with that risk? Um, it, it is actually in the institution's interest to then use those risks, I mean, build on the understanding of those risks to help inform um, regulations and rules, right? And this is where NIST comes in with their, with their processes that consider public interest and, 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 um, and input to come up with, for example, the uh, the CUI, uh, the NIST 800-171 um, set of controls that Ron talked about. Um, if you really think about it, control and classify information in and of itself is really like nonsensical word, set of words, right? I mean, controlled means it's an important information, but unclassified means it's not that important, right? And so really what they're saying is that this information, we'd like you to do something about it, but it's really not that important. And so it's, it's so ambiguous. So it is actually in the institution's interest to have these, these um, um, guidelines, uh, these standards set forth. And why is that? It's just so they can comply to it. I mean, without these standards, we're, we're on the hook for everything. But if someone puts out a set of standards, then we can we can meet it. And then we can say, hey, we did our best as an institution. And then again, and then and then after compliance, it comes out to liability and, and risk as well. Ultimately it comes out to liability. What is what is the institution on the hook for? Um, and, and how can they cover that? And then how does that compare to the payoff uh, that will um, that will result in, in taking on this activity? Um, having that this abstractions and and really what's um, how the institution approaches the, this issue, it allows us to work on um, MOU and other agreements. I mean, everything sort of map onto this, um, not just from UBA, but also from the perspective of our, um, our partner institutions as well. Um, anyhow, that's that's what I wanted to share about that, Ron. Yeah, thank you, though. Um, <clears throat> this diagram <clears throat> was a culmination of a couple of days worth of discussions between me and Tho going back and forth between, we got the rules and regulations, they're supposed to reduce your, your liability, but there's always liability. You have to feed that back into, okay, go to your security team and get some help in, in reducing that risk, which lowers your liability. But at the end of the day, uh, the, the final arbiter here is the cyber insurance, if you think about it that way. They're the ones that are, you know, um, they are the smart people who understand what the liability is, and have amortized that liability across their whole company. And so there's always residual liability and insurance takes care of that at the end. And that's the way we talked to our institute administrators to get them to understand what we were doing and how, <clears throat> how they were covered in the end across this spectrum of, we got regulations and rules, we're gonna comply with them. Our security team's gonna help with that. It's gonna leave us with some amount of liability we're going to cover that with the insurance. That's the way they talked. And that was powerful for us to get that in front of our leadership. Is there a question? Um, okay, right. we do have a question that just came in. Um, okay. Sorry, but I think that statement about CUI and the work on, and the, I think maybe word unclassified is essentially not that important um, was rather unfortunate and also shows an ignorance of what the government sees as distraction of classified data, generally requires a clearance for access and other sensitive but not classified data. I I, I completely agree with that statement. It was it was an attempt at oversimplifying. Um, it, it it was to say that you know without it really needs 
clarification as to what to do about that data, right? I mean, the, the, the term itself, um, it you know, it falls somewhere um, as as uh, Jay says, you know, it it is sensitive data that needs to be protected. It's not classified, um, but we really needed the uh, the specified setup of um, of gu guidance on on how to think about that. I think I think what we're trying to say with that notion is our administrators, some of our administrators are very savvy about what classified data is and what it means. Others may not be. And when you say classified, there's an alarm bell that goes off in your head. Oh my God, this is military data. We have to treat this like, you know, like something special. And at the same time, when you say CUI and it's just controlled, they think of that as a lesser security issue. And it's not. It's just that the data itself has not been officially classified in a certain class to be protected in a certain way. And so it's it's a range of data and a range of protections that are needed and it's confusing. I think that's the point to the whole discussion is it's confusing. Again, we're not working with uh, with you know experts in uh, in securing the data in our in our universities, especially in the smaller universities. We're working with people who are concerned about the risks and the liability that are going on. And so these terms are, as, as I said, the fact that PHI has a different set of protected uh, rules and regulations than CUI, than classified data, than everything else, it's it, it's confusing. So apologies for the, the confusion there, but I hope that makes sense that uh, what we're talking about it from is the uh, from the aspect of an administrator who isn't an expert in these things. If that was Jay's question, Jay, I hope that explained it for you. And, and uh, we can chat about that later if you want to. Uh, so it, when we started expanding to other schools, uh, what we found was uh, several things that, that uh, were interesting to us. Uh, securing across administrative domains is complex. And so why does that matter here? You think, well, you've got a researcher at another university, just let them use your system. Well, it's the endpoint management that uh, was a problem for us. Security is end-to-end. If we have to manage their endpoint, that endpoint belongs to the other university. Uh, we found out the hard way that we put this endpoint management system, the SOPSWAT, on a researcher's computer, and all of a sudden I was getting a phone call from the CISO at that university saying, what are you doing putting securing software on our, on our network? You, know, you can't do that. And so it was one of those things that we learned the hard way uh, it requires that partnership. It requires that everybody works together on these things. Uh, from the standpoint of the lack of direct researcher support, I know NSF has done a lot of work in this area to put out uh, uh, campus champions uh, in places, and that's a wonderful program. Uh, we find that there are still people who they can't afford that. They, they get one, but they can't afford it long term. And so they're they're missing some of the human support there. Uh, we tried to provide some of that. Um, if sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Contracting between schools uh, outside of a research subaward was new territory when we started, especially when security is involved. And it took a lot of work and getting the schools to understand that. So what we did was put together master agreements across the whole university so that any researcher could come in under those master agreements, and that helped. But sometimes we put in three months worth of work on a master agreement to have one researcher. And then that, that research project fell through. And so there was no work on that project. So it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, cyber insurance, we found, like I said earlier, cyber insurance covers that last bit of risk and the liability. But a lot of universities don't have that. The smaller schools, they don't have that. So are they willing to take on that unbounded risk for the liability? And the answer is usually no. And this whole notion of risk sharing across these entities, across multiple entities, I think is still unknown or at best murky. And that we need to do a lot of work there. The fact that we have so many security standards, the fact that it's so complicated, it's hard to convince administrators in smaller schools to take the risk. They would just rather say no. And as those said, that has outcomes. The professors that they hire may not stay because they want to go somewhere else to do their research. We have a few well, slides left and I caught this up. Uh, we want to save some time at the end, so I'll try to go quickly with this. Um, so in, as Ron said, we have um, 
I would say we were very successful with uh, with the core project um, technically, like building a system that is um, that is part of our production service now. Um, on the other hand, you know, broadening access to the um, the under resourced, the, the minority serving non PhD granting institutions, uh, it it was it was a difficult um, journey for us, and and not for the lack of trying. Right. Um, and so we, we learned a few things there, and, and I, I believe these will probably these lessons will probably resonate with everyone. Um, offering resource is it, important, and it's the first step, but it's really only a small part of uh, in in getting um, getting the users uh, from these institution to to really make good use of it. And um, and every institution is different. Not every HPCU school is is the same, right? And that. I don't think we need to expand on that. Um, ultimately, almost everyone that we talk to says that, yeah, it's great, but we just really need someone to come and help us, like who, who, who can, you know, talk to us to understand what we need and and, and give us, you know, guidance along the way. And it, it's a long-term commitment. It's This is not where, you know, we, we, we can even hire someone for a few months because things don't happen in those two, those few months that they, they happen in years, and the, the the pace and the intensity is is it's just ultimately we, we the human expert is is what is most desired. And then um, we also um, learn to appreciate the uh, issues around data rights and sovereignty. There are certain types of data that are collected about communities and and and, and people and and such that are those folks have original rights and 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 you know lightly absolute and, and permanent rights over that that data um issues about being the right to be forgotten you know needs to um, to have their um permission to, sh to to share beyond what was originally collected for uh, secondary data analysis is is great you know to to expand impact and uh, and, and such but the the data rights issue is just, is is definitely something that um, we need to to really consider now. Um, so ultimately, in thinking back, we want um, we need a, a system that is flexible that can that can uh, adopt adapt to the, uh, the the different user communities and 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 then the way of thinking around data and and computations to change. We like. You know, in our community, we like the word software defined this and software defined that, right? I mean, it's like what um can we get to the point of a policy driven sort of infrastructure? Um, I don't even know what that means. So because I don't know what that means, I don't know how we can get there. But um, the Accord system, uh, we have a couple of places where we can flexibly build in um, things as 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 we see them. For example, uh, new. And Ron mentioned the, um, the onboarding process, right? We can add additional agreements, we can add controls, um, we can we can build in these um, sort of extra features for um, to enforce certain policies um, on, on the data, for example. Um, and anyhow, that's um that is something that we we are thinking back now that we really thought that um, you know building that up front and, and sharing that message up front of the flexibility would have been very helpful. Ron, go on. So I mentioned earlier, we have some documents we've created uh, that we're, we're willing to share. Uh, we've done onboarding process that's automated. We had ties into some of our systems uh, in order to pull that data down up front. Uh, we have the research use data agreement that defines in fairly clear terms, what the data can be used for, what the researcher's responsibilities are, what his university's responsibilities are, what our responsibilities were at UVA. Then we had the RACI diagram we mentioned. The MOU or the contract between the universities includes some of the things about notifications that we mentioned earlier. And then we've also got the architecture uh, and the software for the system that Neil put, Neil put together um, available. I guess it's still out on GitHub. Neil, I'm pretty sure that's right. And um, we have documented compliance with the appropriate agencies that and that's available as well. Uh, so w where to, where are we going? Bo, you wanna jump on this one? You're muted though. 
sorry about that. Um, yeah, so um, this is our, our last slide. Uh, where do we go from here? And um, I also appreciate the uh, the question in the chat, right? Um, these, these, these problems that we grappled with, um, this is a learning experience um, that I think many of uh, folks will find uh, familiar. The, um, you know, ultimately we have to, to, to pick and choose our battles. If, if we're not gonna be, you know, we're, we're far from trying to, to be everything for everyone. Um, so how do we make the, where can we make the, the, the difference? Uh, looking forward, uh, we think a, um, a, a set of resources that, um, that we can share with the community that offer, that offer insights through experience, right? I mean, there, there's really enough um, how-to books out there. Uh, but if, if you know, folks can share their insights like ours. Um, you know, others might find uh, their story in there somehow. And if and then if those insights and experiences are tied to um, a repository of artifacts, for example, usable artifacts, um, we we learned that. You know, by sharing our, you know, specifically our MOUs, right? The the these these um, um agreements that we've written up, um, the the RACI diagram that we have, uh, or even our, our um user interface, uh, onboarding processes. These are very usable artifacts. Of course, they, they work for us, doesn't mean they work for everyone, but they're, they're tied to our experience and, and um, hopefully folks will, will be able to use that. And then also, um, I, I, I cannot emphasize enough um, the, the human expertise aspect. We really need, um, we, we really need to, to have the human expertise that is tied to those um, experiences that, that have worked on those artifacts and, and a way to, to make that, uh, connect that with those who need it, right? And, and the, um, building off a core, that's where we want to go from here. We want to um, to work with the community and, and organize such a thing. Um, and it's um, it, it's really, a, I think we all agree that protecting academic data is, is, not a, is no longer a luxury. Like it's something that needs to happen regardless of the size of your institution. And so, um, how how do we, as a community, um, get together and make that happen? Um, yep. Okay. So and, uh, questions. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. I was going to say. Now we have time for questions. Yeah. So we have. First of all, people are very interested in your artifacts. Um, do you have those posted publicly and? Can you can you throw the link in there so I can also include it in the follow up email? So one of the things that we would like to do is to take requests and then talk with you about that. Some of our data we want to some of our stuff we want to protect with an NDA, but uh, we're glad to make it available. Just uh, if I use my email address, uh, Janet, if you want to post that in the chat, feel free to send me a request. And we'll have a conversation and uh, get you access. Okay. Um, would you prefer your Virginia one R or the yeah other the one? Virginia R R H eight eight Z at yep. Virginia that gets you. It's great. Okay. So um, I and I will um, make a reference to that in the email when I send out the video. Yeah. Um. Uh. So it. I believe if I understand correctly. Um, this project is ending. Is that correct? The funding, at least from NSF, is ending, right? The funding in says of September this year. That's right. Okay. And then um, we had a question about the third uh, third party assessor. Uh, what third party assessor did you leverage for the certification of your systems? So I found uh, a person, Heather Engel, uh, E N G O L, I believe. Uh, I can find that that component. Heather worked for the DoD for a while. She's out in public, uh, private practice now uh, in a consulting firm, and we invited her company to come in and do the assessment for us. She did both the, the CUI assessment and worked with us on uh, looking through PHI as well. Okay, and that's the questions that we have so far. So let me grab the screen back so we can let people type, um, and then I'll just kind of briefly go over some community updates. Um, so let me pull up my thing. Um, thanks everyone for coming to this presentation. Um, our next webinar is going to be April 22nd at 11 a.m. Eastern. The topic is fear. Our speakers are David Balanson and Jenna Merkovic. 
Um, to learn more about Trusted CI's webinars uh, or to contact us about presenting, you can email us at webinars.org, or sorry, webinars at trustedci.org. <laughs> That's probably a different address. Don't do that. Um, and for those of you who are going to the Research Infrastructure Workshop next week in Tucson, I'll see you there. I will be there in person. So if you are attending, please come by and say hi to us. We're going to have a table. We're attending a poster session, so we'll be there. Um, we have a question here. Do you plan to continue to provide the Accord service after the funding ends? So um, the Accord service is now part of the production services at University of Virginia. Uh, the fact that the funding from NSF is ending means that uh, UVA will have to make a decision on how they're going to charge for outside folks to use the service and how they would charge for data storage. That's something to be done. But yes, the service is in production now. Uh, it's moving forward uh, at, as a part of UVA's research uh, computing services. Well, that's uh, got to be gratifying, <laughs> but you know the future is a little uncertain. But right. it'll, yeah. <laughs> um, any more questions from the audience before we wrap things up? Um, and also, while people are typing, um, do you do you, any of you have any final thoughts that you want to leave us with? I would love to hear feedback from anybody. Uh, send me an email with any thoughts you have. Glad to have a conversation. Okay, well, with that, I think we'll wrap things up. Thank you so much for presenting. I will get this video, video out later today. And thank you to those of you in the audience for attending. Um, and when I uh, stop the uh, presentation, you'll all be kicked out of the room. <laughs> so I, yeah, I just wanna say thank you for, uh, for coming. And thanks to Trusted CI for hosting this. This is great, a great forum. Great. Well, have a great Thank day, you. everybody. Bye-bye. 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 Thanks so much.